What's that? I think it's good, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, wait a minute. Okay, is this thing, does this normally? It's good, right? That guy in the back probably would have said something. Um, yeah, I think it's fine. It's good. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Um, uh, we'll hand your exams back. I'll do, actually, I'm going to do that in the beginning of class today. And then um, and we'll talk a little bit about this. Uh, the scores are pretty good. Um, you probably found that this is probably the easiest out of the three exams, I would, based on your scores, I'm guessing. Or maybe you just got worried you're going to fail and you started studying harder. I don't know. But um, overall, yeah, it's pretty good. Um, I'm going to post solutions like I normally do, uh, probably today. But if not today, then they'll be up tomorrow. So we'll talk about that. Um, briefly, and then uh, we will talk a little bit about the the final. I'm going to go and do a couple of problems, talk about a couple of your homework problems. I actually, because uh, last week was such a crazy week, um, I think we're just going to um, kind of finish off with what we've done uh, last week. So uh, I know probably some of you feel like you're not getting your, your money's worth here, but um, you've done enough work, enough homework, I, I think. You've probably found this to be somewhat challenging class, and maybe you've honed your logic and proof writing skills a little bit. And that was the main goal, anyways, really, is not to really come away with a really advanced knowledge of number theory, because that stuff gets crazy after a while. But um, hopefully, with those of you that are going to go on and take abstract algebra, you have a lot of experience now writing proofs, and maybe you've gotten a little bit better at that. And, um, you know, um, but I, that's what I'm going to do. We're not going to go into anything else today. So, um, final exam, I'll just give you the basics here. Uh, I'm not going to talk about exactly what's, what's going to be on it yet, but just to recap, the guy that was here last week probably, I, I wanted him to tell you a few things, hopefully he did that. You mentioned something about sideburns, I remember. Sideburns? Oh. That his are colder than yours? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, he has, I, I don't have sideburns, so I guess by <laughs> default, I, I guess that sort of is true. But... Uh, um, yeah, I always give him grief for his, his big sideburns. But uh, so he told you that the final, he gave you a breakdown of where the problems are going to be coming from. Did he give you this? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, can somebody uh, remind us all what that was? Because <laughs> I don't have it with me. 25% is from posted homework solutions, and then 25% is from posted exams. Exam. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So half the exam, stuff that you will have already seen before. I think that's pretty fair, um, given that this is a comprehensive exam. But of course, we haven't done that much, really, this semester. So um, solutions are all going to be you know, posted. You all know where to find these by now, hopefully. And uh, then you know, the, other, the other half is just going to be stuff that you, you know, again, should, should be comfortable with. I think you found on the last exam that the problems were not anything weird. I mean, these are all stuff, things that you'd seen before, more or less. Um, you know, so it's going to be the same thing on the final exam. Uh, it's going to be weighted. Now someone's going to ask, okay, is it, is it going to be more heavily weighted towards the uh, material, you know, toward the end? And, and now the answer is no. Um, everything, it's really going to be weighted about the same. So uh, you should just be looking over everything. Look over your, de you know, the definitions. Look over the things I've told you to look over for the for the three tests. And you know, um, aside from that. Make sure that you know uh, what you did wrong on the exams. Make sure you know what you did wrong on the graded homework. And then, you know, aside from that, I would just say just practice. Practice some problems and, you know, just make sure that you um, know what you're doing. And next week, of course, we don't actually have class um, next Tuesday, right? So what I will do is on Thursday I'll let you know when I'm going to be available next week. So I, I will still be around um, even though it's not, and maybe it'll be during class, normal class time, I don't know yet, so I'll announce that. But I will definitely be around next week and we can talk about um, some stuff. If you just want to come to my office, we can talk about whatever. Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically, I guess I should say the exam is, uh, what, from 140 to 410, I think it is? Somebody make sure I'm right about that? Okay, yeah, 140 to 410, okay. That's next Thursday, next Thursday. And we really sort of have to follow this, this schedule. So, um, but of course, that gives you plenty of time to, to study. 
Um, one thing I'll mention, and you guys are pretty good about this, but I always say it anyways. Uh, it's going to be, it's going to put you in kind of a tough position if you all of a sudden get sick on, on Thursday. Oh, no. Can't take the exam. Well, uh, yeah, or that, yeah. If you're going to do that, I would definitely prefer that you be out of the classroom. That maybe that's a little distracting. Um, so, yeah. Not that, obviously, if you really are sick or something happens, yeah, of course, we'll accommodate you. But I'm going to be probably going out of uh, state for a couple of months, and I'm heading out of here as soon as I can. So um, I, we, can, we can still work it out, but that's going to, you know, don't be here if you can't. That's all I'm saying, okay? Be here. It's, it's definitely in your best interest, because otherwise, you're probably going to have to wait until, until August, and then you're going to have all this time. You know, where you've you know, been out to amusement parks and you've been getting baked in the sun and baked from other stuff. And then by the time you <laughs> come back, your just brain's a mess. So, um, yeah. So why don't I just go ahead and, and uh, get your exams back. I think that lamb boy told you that I added five points to your scores, right? Okay. So you'll see, you'll see the, um, you know... How many you got? So there are 75 points total. I just automatically added the five points. You would say, oh, that's not right, but it's with the five points added. Your percentage is with the five points added, even though I, didn't, I get too lazy to write it down. So. Okay. Okay. Matt. <laughs> A lot of stuff, actually. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, on, I'm, I, no, I'm, I'm getting recorded now. I, can't, I cannot say anything. <clears throat> Maybe the be before class on Thursday I can go into some details. Okay, Eric, not here. Okay. Josh, yes. I always mix you guys up for some reason. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay, do you want to give this to your friend? Okay. David? Kayla, um, would you mind passing that down to? Okay, Andrew. Let's see. And uh, I think that's everyone. Okay, good. Okay, so I'll say a few things about the exam. I'm not going to write very much down, but because it'll be posted online. Um, Let's see. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, number one, you should have gotten because it came right off the last exam. Uh, so it was definitely better than it was. But I could tell also that some of you did not look over this one. Um, and number two, two B is actually false. Um, a lot of you confuse that with the converse. 
If a is congruent to b mod n, then a squared is congruent to b squared mod n. But the other direction is not true. In fact, you can see, if you think about it, I'm, I'm not actually even going to give you a specific example, but think, think about it this way. Um, what do, you, what do you know if a squared is congruent to b squared mod n? That means that n divides a squared minus b squared, which factors as a plus b times a minus b. So if you know that n divides a plus b times a minus b, the, really the question just becomes this. If n divides a plus b times a minus b, does n divide a minus b? And then she, odds are that's probably not true, right? If it, if it divides a product, does it necessarily have to divide the first factor? No, that's not going to be true in general. So that was false. Um, okay, 3a was just the type of problem that we've, we've talked about before. Um, so, I mean, the idea here, I think, is just to notice that 2 to the third is 8, and that's congruent to 1 mod 7. And once you've got that, it's pretty easy after that, right? Um, okay, number 3b. Overall, it was actually, I thought this was going to be a disaster, but um, it, was, it was not as bad as I thought it was going to be. And, uh, of course, we talked about things similar to, the, to this. You had similar problems, at least one or two in your homework, right? So, um, yeah, I don't think I'm going to say much more about, about that. Uh, 4A, most of you got that. Um, 4B, most of you got that. And... Um, yeah, let's see. I'm just trying to see if there's anything I really need to point out here. Um, number five, uh, this problem was actually in the book, and this is one of the problems I actually did in lecture when we talked about the Chinese remainder theorem. So, uh, if you missed it, chances are you you just made a silly computational error, or you just didn't study enough how to do the algorithm because it's just an algorithmic problem. I mean, there's not much to it, right? Okay, number six, finding solutions mod twenty one. Uh, this also, it's just a standard problem. You check to see if the GCD of 6 and 21 divides 15. GCD is 3. That certainly divides 15. So there are three solutions, right? And then from there, um, it's not really hard to solve. I think the easiest way to solve it is just to go through and divide everything by 3 at first. And then you get one solution. And then you have to add n over d. So you have to add 7 twice to get all three of them, right? Okay. And the last one, um, this... Some people had some, some issues with this one, although it was really not much different than what I've talked about in class. Now, I, I, um, I could have reduced the 9, of course, to, to 1, but I wrote this problem specifically because I wanted you to recognize that um, there are a couple ways you can go with this, right? You can bring the x term over or you can bring the y term over. Um, notice that the coefficient in front of y is, and, and 8, the modulus, are not relatively prime. So you're sort of, if, if you really want to do it the, the way the rules dictate, you have to, you, you really need to bring the 2y over to the other side because 3 and 8 are relatively prime, right? And once you've got that, you know that there is a unique solution, no matter what for, so again, for any value of y, there's a unique solution, modulo 8 for x. And then you just go through it the way I did it in class, really, Okay. So this is definitely something I did, and we talked about this, right? So if you do it the way I, that I would have done it, you would end up with y equals t, and I think x was something like 3, uh, 6t plus 3 or something. This person didn't get it right, so. Um, but yeah, and that was, that was it, really. So I think, uh, I think you guys got a fairly reasonable exam here, and... Uh, so I will say that, especially with the extra credit, the five points extra credit, with that awesome extra credit problem I put on the second exam, um, probably there's not going to be a, a, a whole lot of a curve here, especially with me giving you half the exam being stuff you've already seen before. <laughs> okay, so don't expect there to be some big curve where, you know, a, a, a 65 is an A. That's not going to happen. In here. So, on. no, not going to happen. So, mm, no. 66. <laughs> no, I. If you, if you, uh, yeah. If you have, if you have your baby between now and the final, I will give you, I will give you some extra credit, okay? Because that would be an ordeal to have to come and show up at the final. So, yeah, you have to show up no matter what. By the way, so I changed my mind. Um, okay, so let's see. Okay, so here's also what I'm going to do. Um, the homework, 
that, okay, so you have a homework that you'd already turned in that you're, you need to get back, okay? And then there's this final assignment, section 5.2. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to, actually I'm going to extend the, the due date of this last assignment to the final, okay? Um, what I'm going to do is between today and Thursday is uh, we'll just talk about a lot of the problems, okay? okay. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm going to give you a good amount of help with this, okay. you know, but I. I questioned the are you posting the solutions because then that would be right. saying that would be right. part of it. Right. Right. Okay. So that what that means is that you know, yeah, the solutions are not going to be. Um, posted, yeah. Okay. So that, but that, so that just means that's going to eat into the fifty percent of the other stuff, basically. Yeah. Okay. So um, I want you guys to ideally, we'll talk about a few things, but it would, since we only have one more class period, to uh, think about, you know, really, really work on these. I'm not going to. Uh, I'm going to go back. So here's what we're going to do today. Okay. I'm going to talk about a few of these homework problems. I'm not going to talk about a lot of them yet because I really want you to spend some time processing and trying to think about it. We'll talk about more on Thursday, and then um, I'm going to go back over and sort of remind you of um, some things that you should know, especially things that I noticed that some of you had a lot of trouble with. Um, and then Thursday we'll do, uh, you know, maybe I'll do a couple induction problems, you know, maybe some proofs from earlier maybe that you've forgotten about a little bit because things have gotten a lot more computational in the last couple sections. And then we'll, you know, talk a little bit more about the homework. So that's that's sort of the plan. Okay. So so you know where the you know, where to, to study, right? Because you know half of the exam is coming from stuff that we've already seen. So uh, probably not. Probably not. Because you you don't need one. So, uh, yeah, I think, and I also, you know, want to see that you guys can, can, you know, do things like multiply 52 times 4 without, without a calculator. Uh, no. 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 Your, your concession is, your concession is the, is the uh, that 50% of the exam is stuff that you've already done. That, that's a pretty big concession. Yes. Do you know our grade? Yeah. You want to e if you want to email me, yeah. If anyone, uh, you know, yeah. If, if you want to ask questions about your grade, feel free to email me, and I'll, I'll let you know. Uh, what I can tell you is is this: um, if you, okay, so each exam is fifteen percent of your grade, okay. And the uh, let's see, what was the homework? Um, th is it thirty-five percent? Okay, yeah. And the final, yeah, okay. Right, the final is twenty percent. Okay, so here's what you can do. If you want to get an idea, um, your homework. Let's see. Yeah, I, I'm definitely going to drop the lowest homework. I haven't decided if I'm dropping any more than that, but I will definitely drop one for sure. Okay. Um, so what you can do is just is just do this. I mean, if you want to get an idea where you stand, take your first exam score, whatever whatever that percentage is. Take that percentage of fifteen. Do the same for the, the second and the third exams. And if you average your homework, just take that percentage of 35. And then, then you'll get a, you know, then when you add all those numbers up, right, you'll divide by uh, 80, and then that's where you're at, basically. Okay. So, if we're in a number theory class, I would think you should probably be able to handle that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if, if you, you know, if, if you're missing some homework or, or, you know, of course I have them up here, but um, you guys really should be able to figure this out yourself, really. Okay. Uh, but, of course, if you have any questions, I mean, I'll help you, but, you know, you, you should be able to do most of it yourself. Okay. So, let me just start by reminding you of a few things that I think would be important for you to maybe practice, okay, that I've seen um, a lot of mistakes on. Um, okay. Induction should definitely be able to do a proof by induction. And that's kind of what, where we started in this course, was induction. 
So I would strongly encourage you to um, look over that. And, um, you know, there was also, <laughs> there's still some issues with even writing the statements of the first principle and the second principle of induction. So what just happened? I guess I haven't done anything for too long, right? Okay. Uh, all right. Let's see. What do I have to do here? Oh, so that was not the right thing. Oh, yes, it worked. Okay, good. Um, I did not expect that to work. But it, it, okay, wow. Uh, okay, 1.2 uh, binomial theorem, like I was saying, you should know the statement. You should also be able to do some proofs with the binomial theorem. And the plan is, um, you know, I'll remind you of a few of these. We'll, we'll do a couple of these maybe today or, or on Thursday. Okay, so that was it for chapter one. Chapter two, we started with the division algorithm. So you should definitely know what that is. I could ask you, state the division algorithm. I think I did that actually on one of the exams. And so again, you know, this is a kind of a formal mathematical statement, right? So it just says that um, if you take any integer, well, it's, it's in the book, but if you take any integer A and positive integer N, there exists unique integers Q and R such that A equals NQ plus R and R is between 0 and N. One's inclusive, one's not. Right? It can be 0, but it can't get to N. So um, you shouldn't be writing things like, and most of you didn't do this, a few of you did. You shouldn't be saying something like, you divide by N and then there's a remainder. And that's not what it says, okay? Um, okay. <laughs> I don't think you did that. Right. Let's see. Okay. Um, all right. So, and then we started in with um, divisibility uh, properties. And these are things that, um, you know, now we've been using these a lot. I mean, we're talking, you know, we've been talking about congruences, which is just another way of expressing a divisibility assertion. Um, yeah, there's not a whole lot for me to say here. You should you should just be comfortable with it. You should at least be comfortable with with using things like Euclid, excuse me, uh, Euclid's lemma, right? Um, you don't have to. Some of these things you're not they don't have names, so I'm not going to ask you specifically um, to define them or, or to state the theorems. But you should be able to work with them. So, for example, um, if you know that A divides B C and A and B are relatively prime, then A divides C. So you might have a problem, a proof where that fact is going to be used, and so. You know, you should, you should definitely know what, what it is, even if you don't call it by name, but you should be able to work with it, for example. Okay. Uh, we skipped, just to remind you, um, the Euclidean algorithm. We, we, we actually talked a bit about that section, but we didn't do the Euclidean algorithm itself. This is basically, we, we started talking about more properties of the GCD and then the least common multiple. Okay. Then 2.5, we, we did not do. And um, let's see, 3.1, okay, primes. So this is the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, this kind of stuff, okay? So you should de definitely know, for example, what that says. I will not ask you to prove it, but you should know what it says. You should be able to do things like prove that the square root of 2 is irrational. I think the problem you had to do in this uh, section was to show that, uh, let me see, maybe not. At some point, anyways, I, I, I'm pretty sure I asked you to do the problem that uh, asked you to prove the square root of p is irrational, p is a prime. So you should be able to do that as well. And then obviously it goes without saying, the homework you should be comfortable with because some of these are going to be on the exam. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, that was in 3.2, actually. And, um, yeah, I don't have a lot to say about 3.2. Um, Euclid's proof that there are an infinite number of primes appeared in, in that section, and you should just be comfortable with the stuff that we did. Uh, 3-3, three, three, Goldbach conjecture we did not talk about. 
dear Slate student, oh wow, I didn't tell you about that yet. Man, I have not been a good professor this semester. Um, okay, so then we moved on to ch chapter four with congruences. Uh, we started with the basic stuff in 4.2, and then we skipped 4.3, right? And 4.4, linear congruences in the Chinese remainder theorem, of course, this is recent stuff now, so um, this is the kind of stuff we did in the last exam. You should be comfortable with congruences and how, how to solve those. Um, Chinese remainder theorem, of course, we've just been talking about that. And then uh, the last thing is 5.2 with Fermat's theorem and then a couple of corollaries. And um, that is, uh, yeah, that's about it. So what we'll do is, um, you know, I, today I may go back um, and do an induction problem. And then uh, I'm going to talk about a couple problems in 5.2 today. Like, like I said, I'm not going to talk about it, a lot of them. So I really want you to spend a little time, if possible, between now and Thursday thinking about some of these yourselves. So. I'll, I'll talk about a couple, maybe two or three, and then we'll do an induction problem, binomial theorem problem. You know, something else you guys feel rusty on and want to <laughs> see, you know, I can do pretty much whatever you guys want me to do. So uh, let's just do that first, though, to make sure we get that out of the way. So um, let's see. The, yeah, the web page, at least with the assignments, will be updated today for sure. Um, I'm going to try to get the solutions posted as well. But like I said, if, if not today, then they'll be up by, by uh, Thursday's class. Okay. Um, so, I've forgotten how to do this. Okay, five, two. There we go. I do want to say something. I may not do this whole thing, but this whole problem. But uh, number one, ask you to show that uh, 11 to the 104th power is congruent to minus 1 mod 17. Okay. All right. So here's the idea. Well, actually, that's not what it said. Sorry. I. Okay. It said that, I mean, yeah, basically, it said I, uh, to prove that 17 divides 11 to the 104 plus 1. Right? That was the statement of the problem. Okay. Now, I, I want you to notice something. And with Fermat's uh, theorem, right, Fermat's theorem said that if A is an integer, P is a prime, P doesn't divide A, then A to the P minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod P congruent to 1 mod p. This problem, though, is not, you, you don't end up getting a 1 on the, on the right side. It's a minus 1 on the right side. So don't just go on autopilot and just always throw a 1 over on the. On. You have to look at the problem. Make sure that you understand what it's saying. Okay? So 17 dividing 11 to the 104 plus 1 translates into this, right? And vice versa. So, all right. Well, what is this really saying? So, I mean, there, there are a couple ways I think that you could go about this in a reasonable way. Uh, this is the same as 11 to the 104 being congruent to 16. I'm just sort of jotting down the main ideas here. I'm not trying to make this a polished solution. Mod 17, right? So this, this, this is what you want This is what you must prove, right? Everybody with me here? Okay. 11 to the 104 congruent to 16 mod 17. Is minus 1 is 16, modulo 17. So, don't hurt the baby. Um, so, you um, want to use Fermat's theorem here in some way. And so that what you do is you just do it the most natural way here, and um, you notice that um, 17 and 11 are both primes, and 17 does not divide 11. So by Fermat's theorem, 11 to the 17 minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod 17, right? And again, like I said, I want to reiterate here, I'm, I'm just jot jotting down notes, really. Um, 
Okay, so for Moss Theorem. Okay. That is, of course, 11 to the 16th is congruent to 1 mod 17. Okay. So, we see what we want to prove up above. 11 to the 104 is congruent to 16 mod 17. Well, of course, we're not going to be able to get to 16 by raising both sides to powers because 1 to any power is still going to be 1. Right? So the point is we should get, be able to get close, and then whatever else we need, let's see if we can just verify that independently and then just put it all together at the end. Okay. And I'm not going to do this entire thing, but uh, you've seen this trick before, of course. So you want to get to uh, the 104th power, right? So let's see if we can figure out what power to raise this to. Okay, so what do we want? Okay, well... Okay, yeah. So the, the point is, why did I choose 6? Because that gives us 96. If I use anything bigger than that, we're going to overshoot the 104th power. So um, once we've got this, this is what we get, right? And you might say, well, okay, well, that has taken us closer, but we still have a little bit more work to do, right? So now the question is, okay, what is it that we really want additionally? We want... Now think about this. We want to get to 11 to the 104th power. So what we really would like here is 11 to the 8th to be congruent to 16. This is where you have to, you do have to keep in mind some of the um, theorems that we've established for congruences. And this is probably where I'm going to stop here, but I just want to make sure that you can see what I'm, what I'm saying. And I'm also not saying this is the only way to do the problem. This is just one way that I think is reasonable. If you can establish this, then there's a theorem that goes way back that says if A is congruent to B mod N and C is congruent to D mod N, then AC is congruent to BD mod N. I believe that's in the book, I think. It's definitely true. Um, let's see. Yeah, it's in the book, theorem, theorem uh, 4.2. Yeah. Okay, so you can see how this finishes the problem, right? Because you can, then you can just multiply them together, and then you get what you need. Okay? Does that make sense? So this is the other thing that you should be looking at. And um, yeah, uh, this other part, I, sh I should also say that um, you can do this without using, you might think, oh, I need to use it for Maz's theorem or something. You really don't need to, to do that here. And in fact, I don't even know if that's going to apply in this case. but. I mean, what you can what you can do. I'm not. You know, no, I'm not. I'm not even going to say anything else. It's uh, you don't have to do much. I'll just say that. But for this, for establishing this, if you want to do it this way, don't be thinking about Fermat's theorem to, to do this. Okay, you, you just. Yeah, I give it away if I say anything else. I'm, I'm not going to. But think about it. Okay. Okay. So, I wanted to talk about this just because uh, of the minus one here. But, um, okay, so this one, does everybody have this down now? Okay. All 
All right. So number two, I'm actually going to let you think about for a bit. Um, I will probably tell you something on Thursday. I will tell you that um, to be, you're going to, essentially what, you're, what this is going to amount to is um, you're going to apply for Ma's theorem a couple of times, and then you're going to have to show that 8 divides a to the 6 minus 1. And so um, this is something that um, you might have to resort to some earlier techniques to do this. I don't see a real slick way of, of doing this off the top of my head. I looked at it for a minute. I'll, I'll think about it a little bit more. But um, Fermat's theorem is really not going to apply directly to showing that he divides a to the 6 minus 1. It is something, certainly you can do it using the division algorithm and using the fact that a and 42 are relatively prime. But it requires a little bit of work. But um, I'll see if I can give you a hint if I see a, a shorter way to do that. But thinking about the division algorithm is something that will, you should be able to get it at the very least. Yes? I don't know if this is uh, relevant to what you just said, mm -hmm. but I think it's 3 times 7 times 8. That quantity divides. No, it is. But I, what I'm saying is you're going to take your... The natural way to do this is to kind of take them separately. So it's relatively prime, so then you get it at the end. So you have three cases. You've got, you want to take care of three and seven and eight. And then you, then you get it for free by what we've done before. Okay. Now, yeah, sorry, I, didn't, I wasn't clear on that part. So the three and the seven are, are pretty straightforward. I think they work out more or less uh, really quickly just using Fermat's theorem. That the eight is the one where you... Some of these things are not going to... It's not going to be... Uh, that Fermat's theorem is sort of a silver bullet that just takes care of everything for you immediately. You might, you're going to have to work a little bit uh, with some of the other ones. Eight is two times two times zero. Yes, but that doesn't really help you. Because two, yeah, I mean, if, if you know, I mean, for example, if you know that two divides a number and three divides a number, then you can get six dividing the number. But if you, if you know that two divides a number and two divides a number, well, of course, you automatically get that, but that doesn't mean that four divides it. Because two divides two and two divides two, but four doesn't divide two. So you can't do that unless they're relatively prime in general. Yeah. Um, so I think one thing that you can do, um, you, you still might have to do a little bit of work, but there are uh, ways that you can sort of break this down, right? A to the 6 minus 1, you can actually factor. Okay? And you also know, so this is what I'll say for now. You can factor A to the 6 minus 1, and you also know that, uh, maybe I should write this down. Sorry, I'm being, I'm being lazy. Okay. So... Two. Yeah, sorry about that. All right. A week off of work, I get lazy. Um, okay. So really, the, what, you're, what you're trying to show, this is, this is just part of, of the problem. You have to show that 8 divides a to the 6th minus 1. All right, so I'm just giving you a couple of ideas. Um, I still am a little bit behind, so I didn't, I didn't really get to look at this as much as I, I wanted to. But um, a to the 6 minus 1 is the same thing as a cubed squared, right, minus 1 or 1 squared, difference of squares, which is um, a cubed plus 1 times a cubed minus 1. You should remember this from basic algebra calculus. You know. Now, this is something um, that I will tell you that you may not have known, but this, you can look this up online if you want to. So, I'll remind you of this. Maybe some of you didn't know this, but um, you can't, when I say can't, I mean in the normal way, using just real numbers. You can't factor things of the form x squared plus a squared. You can't factor those. But you can factor things of the form x cubed plus a cubed. These can be factored. And so this is a sum of cubes. This is a difference of cubes because 1 and 1 cubed are the same thing. Now you're going to get, actually you're going to be able to break this down into four pieces. 
the product of four things. Okay, and if you mess with it, uh, I haven't actually just I just kind of did this off the top of my head. But if you mess with it, you might be able to just get the get the result to come out right away. But th there's one thing you should notice. Let me just write this down. Now again, when I'm saying this factor, I, I don't necessarily mean that this is going to work or that this is all that you have to do. That's not what I'm saying. But this is the kind of stuff you should be thinking about. Because if you, if you want 8 to divide this thing, well, it's not enough just to know that 2 divides it. That doesn't give it to you. You can say that, remember, the GCD of, what was it, A and 42 is equal to 1, right? This is given in the problem. And that, what does that tell us? So A has to be odd, right? Now you might say, oh, OK, well, great. If A is odd, then powers of an odd number are odd. So 8 cubed plus 1 then should be even. 8 cubed minus 1 should be even. So that takes care of 4. But that's not quite enough. We, we really need the 8 to, to pop out somehow, OK? So I would encourage you to play with this a little bit and see what you can come up with. OK. So I didn't really say too much about, about this. Um, let's see here. I'm going to say something about number. Um, Let's see, what number is this? So 5, 2. Yeah, 6. So I'm going to talk about 6a here. I, I will probably give you a hint for the other one next time. I'm not going to do the whole problem for you. But um, 6a, find the unit's digit of 3 to the 100th. I don't think that, I didn't look through the section that carefully, but I don't, I don't think that the, book, the author gave you an example of, of this in the, in the section. So some of you might be thinking, how do, you, how do you do that? How do you really convert this to a congruence? Okay. Using, okay, and I, I should also, sorry, um, sorry, this is really <laughs> crooked here, but um, the directions specifically say to do this using Fermat's theorem, right? That's what it says. So if you just do this the way you, I always, I, I got to come up with some other lines, but if you do this the way you would have when you were in eighth grade, um, you could sol probably sol solve this problem pretty quickly, actually. This is not that hard, even if you didn't know anything, because you're going to see a pattern. Um, 3 to the first, the unit's digit, the one's digit, in other words, is 3. 3 squared, it's 9. 3 cubed is 27. Multiply by 3, it's going to be 1. Right? Then you multiply by 3, it's going to be 3, and then you're going to see this. It's just going to cycle through. It's going to keep cycling. And the pattern's going to repeat, and you'll be able to see what the unit's digit of 3 to the 100 excuse me, 3 to the 100th is very quickly without applying for Ma's theorem. But that's not what the author wants you to do, and I don't want you to do that either. I would like you to see how to apply the theory in the section to do the problem. So how do you do that? Well, how do we translate the, the one's digit or the unit's digit into some sort of a congruence type problem? Well. Let's just look at a specific example. Unit di uh, can't talk today. The unit's digit of, say, 54, right, is, well, you all know what this is, 4. And what's the relationship here? Well, also, Note that uh, 54 is congruent to 4, I'm running out of room here, mod 10, right? OK. 
Okay, so here's the idea. And I think if you just try to listen and think about it, I don't think writing anything down is really going to help you here. Whatever the, the ones digit of a, of a number is, it's, that is the same thing as what the number is congruent to mod 10. It, that's always the case. And the, the reason is because if you just take that ones digit off and make it a zero, that's zero mod 10. Because 10 is going to divide it because it ends in a zero. So then when you tack it back on, that's what you get mod 10. Right? Does that make sense? Sort of? Okay. So what you're doing, if you want to find the units digit or the ones digit of a number, is you just want to see what it's, equal, what it's congruent to modulo 10. That's all you're doing here. So um, I'll tell you that this problem is, um, there's not a whole lot going on here. Um, uh, I will tell you, can I go to the next page here now? Yeah? Okay. All right. So uh, let me change this to a W. Okay. I'll just write this out more formally now. We want to find the integer a, um, which satisfies 0 less than or equal to a less than, I'll just write it this way, with 3 to the 100th congruent to a mod 10, right? Okay, that's just another way of saying we want to see what is congruent to mod 10. Okay, so how can you do this? Well, Uh, and I will say something about this because I don't know that we did this in lecture, but you can't immediately apply Fermat's theorem or the corollary to this because 10 is not a prime, right? That only works for primes. Um, I did give you a corollary, though, that says that basically if you can break the number up into the product of two primes, then you can just kind of put the pieces together, roughly. I think I gave that to you. I should have. So um, 3 squared... Uh, is congruent to 3 mod 2. This is for Mod's theorem. No. Uh, well, actually, it's not. It's the corollary to Fermat's theorem, which says that for any integer a in any prime p, a to the p is congruent to a mod p. And so there's a can be anything. It can be divisible by p, even. Uh, that was the corollary, like I said. So since 2 is a prime, any number squared is congruent to itself, mod 2. Okay? And 3 to the fifth is congruent to 3 mod 5, right? And that's also the corollary. A to the P is congruent to A mod P, and these are both primes. So we're good here. Now what you can do is put these together. Um, I will actually use the numbering in the book here, but if I didn't give this to you, somebody should yell at me here, but I, I'm pretty sure that I, I did. Um, hmm, four, three, five, two, okay. Uh, this was, well, you know, where, well, where I'm going with this is that lemma on page 89. Lemma on page 89. It's just called a, a lemma. I didn't think, see there was any numbering here. Okay, good. All right. I'm not totally worthless. Let's see. Okay. So um, what that says then is that you can, if the primes are distinct, the modulus is, they're, they're both primes and the, the moduli are distinct primes, then what, what this lemma says, and this should be in your notes, is that you can just multiply the powers together. And so in this case, we get 3 to the 10th is congruent to 3 mod 10, right?
Make sense? Okay. The number one says for in order to apply it, we would have to do three to the fifth to go to three line two. Hmm. Let me see. I don't think so. Um, so this lemma says that. Oh, right, 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 right. Okay. So yeah, the the. Um, but actually, let me see. So right. Um, I don't think. Let's see if this is actually going to matter though. Um, Right, right, right. Okay, so that yeah, so this this lemma I didn't look at this closely enough here. So the lemma says that uh, you need a to the p right a to the p is congruent to a mod q, and a to the q is congruent to a mod p. Okay, so um, yeah, and so in this case, I guess that's probably that's not true in this case, is it? Let's see here. Okay. So, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So this is not scratch that. This is not what we. This is not what we want here. But um, let's see here. But um, let's see. All right. Yeah. So this. Let me. <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah. Nope. No, 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 no. This is not what we want to do. Okay. Scratch that whole thing. Okay. Okay. So, let's see. This lemma. You can probably... Let's see here. So, hang on. Yeah, I, I just briefly skimmed this. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah, so this is not, okay. This I don't think this lemma is going to apply directly here because even trying to flip it around is just, then it's just not true what you need in order to apply the lemma. So, um I'll tell you what, let me, uh, let me come back to this. Let me come back to this problem on Thursday. So, yeah, sorry about that. Well, I had to screw up at least one problem this, this semester. I think this is the only one I actually screwed up. Um, okay. So, <laughs> too late, too bad. All right. Um, here. Let's, uh, like I said, let me let me come back to this on Thursday. This is, uh, I think this is the last one I'm going to say anything about. A to the ninth is congruent, and I'm not going to say much about this one. Um, A to the ninth is congruent to A mod 30. Okay. So, what I will say here, and this is all I'm going to say for now, but is simply to note that, and this is really, of course, you already know this, but uh, this is 2 times 3 times 5, right? Okay, and um, you, let's see, let me make sure that <laughs> I don't tell you something that's not true. Okay. So, um, yeah, all I'm going to say here is, okay, 
So think about this and this, the fact that we can break this up into primes, and if you put these pieces together, you can actually you can get this to work out. There's one little trick involved here, but uh, I don't want to say anything about that right now. Um, I might give you another additional hint on Thursday, but um, this one is fairly straightforward. Okay, so let's see. All right, I guess we have a little bit more time to kill here. Anything um, anyone would like to ask about? Yes. Um, there's, well, you did a 2A mm -hmm. for us prior, and okay. um, you don't need to go through all of it, but mm -hmm. the last step of it has been bothering me, and okay. I'm hoping that you can point me. Okay. You can fix that for me. Basically, you derive um, a to 12 congruence 1 mod 5, and you also derive um, a to 12 congruence 1 mod 7. Okay. And then you just kind of mush them together and say a to 12 congruence 1 mod 35. Okay. And um, I've, I've seen that in a prior homework assignment, but mm -hmm. I can't think of yeah. it being proved generally. And, uh, okay, so, so yeah, say that what, what it was again. I had What did I have? Something um, congruent to? You had a to the 12 congruent 1 mod 7. Mm -hmm. And a to the 12 congruent 1 mod 5? Right. Yeah. Um, it's because. Uh, it's because think about translate it into a divisibility problem. A to the twelfth congruent to one mod seven means seven divides a to the twelfth minus one. A to the twelfth congruent to one mod five means five divides a to the twelfth minus one. Because seven and five are relatively prime, their product divides a to the twelfth minus one. Isn't there all yeah. that's corollary to on page twenty-two? Okay. Uh, what about that other property that says like a is congruent to b mod law and b is congruent to c? Mm -hmm. You can always yeah you can flip congruences. Um, there's a theorem that kind of collects all of these in chapter four. So the one where you flip them, if they're both, you could have just said this, 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 right? Are you talking about his question now or something different? I don't know. I thought it was different. Can you always just smush things? Like if, okay, if, if you have the, um, here's what you need, okay? I mean, you can do this in general. Here, here's what you really need, though. I'm just going to use A and B here. So suppose you have A congruent to B. Um, so for the one on, or two online students, I finally learned my lesson at the end of the uh, semester. Question is, when you have a bunch of congruences, when can you sort of smush all the moduli together to get one big number? Well, what you need here is for the two guys on the left and right to be the same. So for example, if you have something like this, I'm just using A and B, but If you have something like this, if n1, n2, I'm, I'm just doing this for three, but it works in general, are um, what are called uh, pairwise relatively prime, right? Then a is congruent to B mod the product. Okay. And again, this just really is just a translation of divisibility uh, Euclid's lemma type result from chapter four or chapter three. I don't maybe no chapter two, I guess, was it? Yeah, chapter two. So uh, the point is if you have both of these being the same, then what this is really saying is, remember, this is just the same thing as the assertion that n1 divides a minus b. So n1 divides a minus b, n2 divides a minus b, n3 divides a minus b. So then the product divides it because they're relatively prime. Make sense? Okay. Is there anything for uh, an even higher modulus? Can you do like n1, 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 n2, n3? Um, no. Uh, in general, you can't do that because then what you're saying for example, just make, to make it simple, suppose you have a congruent to b mod n1 and a congruent to b mod n1. Well, you can't say that a is congruent to b mod n1 squared, for example, necessarily, because, you know, um, I mean, you could take a to be 4, b to be 2, and n1 to be 2, for example, and then, yeah, it's not going to work. No, you, know, you can't go up with powers here. Um, you, you really need all of them to be, to not share any common factors. Okay. Um, any other questions you want to ask? We'll do. We'll talk in a little more depth on Thursday about about some of these. Okay. 
No? No? Okay. Sounds good. Um, like I said, I'm going to get the web page updated and um, solutions will be posted to the exam pretty soon. So I'll be looking over that to help you.